I have been following uh, the entire IDAC on YouTube since morning, probably. So one request to everyone over here is because the only comment on YouTube throughout the day, which was common, not audible. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a request to everyone, please keep the mics as close as possible so that at least everybody can listen all the insightful things that we're going to share now. So a lot of us in the panel come from uh, the real good old days of advertising and digital marketing when digital was the starting in the country. Uh, me and Manas have worked very closely almost for uh, 15 plus years now. And uh, today we are sitting in the same forum discussing the role of uh, independent agencies, as we call it challenger agencies, how we are shaping the entire landscape of uh, digital media or rather advertising as per se. So uh, as the introduction has already happened, I would want to first thing first uh, go to Dave and understand how the data, the first party, second party, th third party data is going to impact us. Uh, most of the clients today talk about conversions and how the data is going to affect us. Dave, would you like? Yeah, sure. So, um, I hope I'm audible. Yeah. So, the way I am looking at it is, uh, you know, obviously, uh, there is a huge amount of hue and cry about third party data and the amount of data that gets in the hands of uh, publishers. And uh, I think to a large extent, it's quite a reasonable uh, concern that a lot of people have. The only thing is that there's enough and more that's happening to build an alternate way of identifying uh, or creating cohorts of uh, behaviors, I would say, uh, without sharing any personal information. So there's so much that is happening, uh, whether it is through uh, universal IDs that a lot of uh, you know uh, independent partners are building, whether it is through uh, really focusing on f building first party data that a lot of brands have started doing, which is whether it is through their own D2C website, whether it is through communities, uh, all of that is also happening in a very big way. Or um, I was reading this uh, strategy around contextual targeting, which you know obviously a lot of us do, uh, rather than talking to actual users uh, or specific users, I would say you end up talking to cohorts who are reading or consuming a certain kind of content. So there are there are ways in which I think uh, the two things can happen. It is not that efficient targeting means that you have to necessarily know everything about a user and uh, capture a lot of private information about them that they may not w want to share. Um, but there could be a workaround that uh, has started emerging. So, so I think in the long term, this will probably be a more effective way of meeting both ends, essentially. That's my sense, I guess. Wonderfully said. However, uh, Manas, I would want definitely your two cents on this. Uh, the data deprecation, as I know you come from hardcore media background, right? From Samsung days to today, whatever you are doing, and plus, you handle one of the most demanding performance clients, as I know. So as per you, how difficult it's going to become? Can you just guide us? Because we are also an agency, right? We would want to understand how to address this. The performance, how the performance will get affected because of the data deprecation, the first party data. We all understand what happened to media maths, yeah. right? So, uh, I mean, yep. so uh, when, you, when you talk about data, uh, we, uh, you know, we were having a session just uh, next door and, uh, you know, what, what we were talking about is at times we overanalyze data and we talk about digital being a measurable medium, which is why, you know, many a times, you know, if it's spent 50 lakhs, it's 5 lakhs. Whatever we measure, you know, and we also know historically back in the day that TV se koi koi question poochta nahi tha. And when we start overanalyzing things, then the pie goes smaller. You know, while it's solving the same purpose, probably giving you a better customer through precise targeting, you know, when we do it on digital, but uh, because of the fact that we tell them that we can have real-time reporting, probably it will attribute through view through conversions for the final performance and everything else also. So many a times the pie gets smaller. While it is doing a better service than probably a TV advertising would be doing, and probably giving you a better audience say through CTV advertising, still like we are the ones who are deselling our own products, you know, to the customers also at times. And it has to be, you know, when we look at the entire consumer journey also. So 
पूरी दुनिया बात करती है कि अवेयरनेस करना है तो टीवी भी करना है और साथ में कुछ और भी करना है सो द स्ट्रैटेजी शुड बी दैट इन द एंटायर आयदा मॉडल विच इज अवेयरनेस इंटरेस्ट डिजायर एक्शन एंड यू नो यूजिंग दोज कस्टमर्स फॉर यू नो टॉकिंग अबाउट योर ओन प्रोडक्ट ऑल्सो इन द एंटायर जर्नी वी शुड टॉक अबाउट द एंटायर जर्नी रा दैन ओनली कन्वर्जन मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम्स बिकॉज देर इज अ सर्टन साइकिल टू द ब्रांड इज वेल you know an established brand probably like a bajaj and hdfc who already has a great brand salience their brand plus generic keywords are well known you know in the outside industry very very well they probably don't need that amount of awareness indexing and everything else which is attached to it while in the current set of things where so many investors have invested in say new startups and everything they are the ones who actually need a lot of awareness indexing a lot of buying and also creation of first party data over a period of time to reach a certain situation where they can only bank on performance but till that time there is an important need to spend a lot of money on awareness reaching the right set of customers getting high on the consideration set also and in situations where you do not have you know as much budgets to uh, you know probably do awareness indexing you have to rely on the category and the competition to create that category and you need to bank on that to uh, you know for your own product thank you that was very insightful uh, so you just used a keyword yeah. while addressing the situation ctv we all understand connected tvs probably i had my first smart tv back in 16 or 17 but we never used to call it ctv those days So, Shraddha, would you like to throw some lights how the connected TVs are playing, or what role are they playing in today's media landscape, and how digital agencies can embrace that instead of just using it as a jargon or a keyword, but actual utility in our media mixes? So, uh, I'll be happy to So I'll start with a small anecdote. Today, if you look at uh, CTVs or connected TVs, we are only 25 million as per the last stats, right? Uh, it's not huge, given the fact that we are 700 million as an internet audience. But the best part is the decisions for any marketing plan are taken. Are taken. Hello. Yeah, it's back. It's back. Uh, hello. No, it's gone again. Okay. So um, the discussions happen in boardrooms. Now I was sitting with an FD of a renowned brand who is the largest in its category, and when we were doing this discussion, he was like, "मैंने तो बंद कर दिया TV देखना. मैं तो सिर्फ Netflix और Amazon देखता हूँ. आप देखते हैं क्या? शर्मा जी आप देखते हैं. जब हम देखते ही नहीं हैं तो किसके लिए ad चला रहे हैं हम TV पे? Right? And that's where the discussion genuinely starts. Right? it's not difficult to sell connected tv in a boardroom still despite the number is 25 million but it's also a great platform for you to now see what this can bring in terms of innovation precise targeting better placements right because you can only say that i want to target somebody who's watching only horror category or fashion category bark is a sample plan right on tv it is on a sample set but here you have exact data yes it is overselling and manas will kill me for that because in the lower funnel you'll be literally uh, putting pixels on everybody but at the end of the day still it's better than the tv that is going on there right so i think from the perspective of future from the perspective of mds and ceos it's a great platform to advertise on the next thing which i think uh, connected tv can bring in is a lot of lower funnel and mid funnel as well i am watching a show and what happens is uh, let's say i'm watching night manager and my husband will be like, i like this girl you know yeah let me just tell you a little more details about it here's the name of it and then we'll go to wikipedia and search her age and other stuff about her but what we don't realize is it's not just about the girl that or the boy that you're watching on the tv but you can also actually see the product that they're using right you can actually see that okay if this is the product that you're watching is there a way of knowing more about this place or product can i buy it so there's a lot of integration for this audience on connected tv which you don't find in your regular tv so it's more two way I might also have a survey which says, "Did you like the project that I was watching?" We had Netflix and Ranveer Singh, which was wild, and something where we have interactivity. We could change the course of what what 
be watching, right? So that way, I think it has a great future and would be helpful in terms of driving more two-way communication too. Thank you. So that was pure play media insights given to us from Shraddha. But again, I derive another keyword over here. So I think uh, I would want to ask Ranjit over here. So on connected TVs, as very clearly mentioned, it's still a TV, but measurable, right? That's how I can zero on, right? But as it is measurable, so just and because see, we are seeing the technology is evolving every day, even on TVs, right? Sony, LG, bringing something new every day. So can we say in future, this journey can be completed, the consumer journey on connected TV? From seeing an ad to completing a transaction within the TV frame and not moving to another device? Is it possible or is that innovation which is going to take over this entire journey or is it the creatively we're going to entice a customer to complete the purchase cycle within the TV ecosystem or the connected TV ecosystem? So I think the one important part of connected TV is that uh, the TV in its own form, which which uh, used to be a social experience at home, uh, is slowly giving way to a personal TV. So like your personal mobile phone, most houses today have two, three TVs. If uh, And so it's a personal TV for them. So your question actually is that in a social experiment, in a, in a social setting, shopping, if you're watching a soap with your family together, kids and stuff, may not be the right, I would say, uh, thing to solve also, but when you have a personal TV, like my daughter today would watch her show on her own TV and would actually go back and search those stuff that that uh, she's watching on a mobile phone. So, like, I mean, uh, uh, what you're saying that how can we bridge the gap bet between that experience of shopping or exploration between those two uh, devices? In fact, there are there are certain certain, um, say, applications in the US were trying to solve that. While you are watching TV, those products pops out or it gives you a prompt, uh, like you were saying, and you actually do a voice command and shop or have, have some sort of interaction without going to other device. So I think uh, those things are there. Uh, Amazon has tried with uh, Alexa and Alexa TV also. So yes, I mean, in future, you'll be able to shop off TV but it will, be, uh, it, it will be equal to a personal experience, not a social experience, so to say, at home. I agree, shopping has always been a personal experience for all of us. Manas. Yeah, I, I'll try and answer that and disintegrate into two parts. So, there are multiple devices hote and devices are connected. Uh, and I was also in a closed room session there and, you know, this question was asked. So, you know, if you put, like, say, a coupon code or something there, uh, it's a 20 seconder which goes there. And you know, by the time you probably take something out to purchase something and do that entire process, those 20 seconds are gone. But the IP addresses are captured. So the system understands that these are the IPs, you know, from where an entire family is probably connecting and they might have witnessed a certain ad. So for me to attribute to that specific ad, I can target the device which is running on the same Wi-Fi and an IP. That's where my entire journey probably can be completed from a screen which is a smart screen coming back to my phone, and uh, the system knows the frequency at which it is being served, probably showing it in, in that ecosystem again, might continue that journey and eventually culminate into a purchase pattern which can happen. And this is also an integration probably of, of a couple of things in uh, some of, there are some products like Silverpush had a product that if you're seeing something on TV, you can uh, you know probably target them on your mobile phone. And what CTV is providing you an entire ecosystem that you can do that along with this and then culminate into an action later on. So those twin screen problem, I think it's solved there. Pretty bang on, I would say. Um, both the answers, Ranjit, uh, what the example of Amazon Echo was bang on. And I don't have the numbers right now, but I was going through this uh, study back in US is happening. The majority of the list shopping, as we call it, the regular groceries, are done through Amazon Echo now. People just while moving to the office tell the Echo that, okay, please arrange all these stocks for me when I'm back. And actually it is happening. And uh, what Mana said, uh, for non-grocery shops, which may be a mobile phone or anything which is of larger purchase value, uh, probably a connected experience is more important than a connected TV alone. 
right? So a follow through communication from our TV to the same IP mobile address because once we are home, we are all connected to the same Wi-Fi and we cannot deny that, right? So yes, I think both the answers are bang on and we both, uh, or rather we all are aligned to that. Now coming on, uh, uh, another challenge that all the agencies, the challenger brands or the uh, independent agencies as we all are face is the content part, right? So if we look at the pitches that we all make, uh, the pitches were pitches and still are the same pitches which are driven by ideas, followed by great creative, some out of the line rationals to explain those ideas and creative, and then coupled with great media integration ideas, everything, right? But from top to bottom, we see content being part of everything, from an idea stage to the campaign stage to the media stage. So we are living in the content economy. The content creators are probably having bigger top line than us. <laughs> So True. how relevant the content is today for any pitch, is it <laughs> that you have to have a content creator only to win the pitch or without a content creator, micro, macro influencers, I don't know. So I think we, you can answer me that, Mr. Mehta. Yeah, so uh, I just want to first uh, double check on the question, but uh, the next uh, session is by Prajakta Kohli. So uh, I think while we speak about top lines, I think uh, we will have uh, her as a benchmark the way that how individual brands have probably gone uh, above the roof and have actually nailed the entire market. Now there's a word that's roaming around. They are calling it single person unicorn. Oh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Beast is uh, yeah, he is, moving he in is, that direction. He is. But yeah, Logan so Paul, he is. Yeah. He, he is that way. So uh, we really feel that while the entire economy is taking its shape, right? I really don't, um, I really don't see this not happening. That there are going to be maybe single person unicorns or people with hundred million following, just creating content in Marathi. So the population of Maharashtra would be, I think, 19 odd crores or something like that. So I really feel that if at all there is a channel uh, like Mr. Beast, right? That's probably 10 crores right now, and it's it's growing like anything. So I feel uh, speaking about creators, uh, that's that's a very sound arena where now a lot of agencies are trying to figure out how to capture that market, how to probably have something in the intersection of content x ROI x creators. So yeah, but I'd want to understand the question. Uh, no, so I you you what you yeah. said is right, but. My point was, see, we are looking at, we are uh, independent agencies, but today we see even creators are getting cartelized. Yeah. They're part of larger celebrity management groups. Yeah. The cost of a creator has skyrocketed, right? So for me to buy a television artist to endorse my product vis-a-vis -a, -vis a creator, TV artists are coming cheap today for me. Yeah. Yeah. Trust me, right? Yeah. I cannot comment on the efficacy of both, right? Who is going to create a bigger hype for me? Probably if it, my product is for Gen Z. If I'm selling a Realme earbud, probably uh, a creator might work better, but if I'm selling an FMCG product, a TV seller will still work for me more, yeah. right? And this is, this is a con constant debate that will continue. My only point is in the current age, like times recently entered yeah. the creator business, right? The creators, which as an agency, I might be paying 100,000. Today I've been requested to pay 500,000 for the same. My clients question this. <laughs> right? So, as we are sitting on this forum, how to address this question? That's my point is. Yeah. Or shall I go with micro, macro, instead of the bigger A-listers? Yeah. So, what is that? Yeah, so I think there's a technical answer to it. I, I'd want to uh, touch upon that. Uh, but before that, uh, just a little bit of context around what we guys do. Uh, maybe that question uh, is relatively more relevant to the work that we guys are into. So we are, uh, and we, we are this influencer platform that's predominantly uh, in the Vernac space. We pivoted into now a SaaS that's supporting marketing agencies, create their own communities of influencers and brands via a full-fledged tech experience. Uh, more on this later, but uh, the fact that right now the entire age uh, is so much to do with going hyper niche, hyper local, 
if at all you have an influencer that is uh, relatively wider in terms of their reach versus if you get influencer who are hyper niche. So we call it the six R theory in CultureX. Uh, while you want to pick an influencer, you largely think that uh, picking an influencer is so much to do with their fandom. Uh, the first aspect of it is reach, of course, which is their fandom. Second is so much to do with the kind of resonance that they have, the category that they lie in. The third R is so much to do with the largely reputation that they hold, what uh, kind of background that they have. Somebody uh, like a Ranveer Kapoor will have a relatively sound reputation versus somebody uh, who's just starting out as an actor working in Bihar. Uh, so that's another R. Then it's so much to do with region. We are all speaking about vernacular and stuff like that. We are speaking about then uh, the relevance of that influencer, what category uh, he comes from. Uh, then we are speaking about the, of course, ROI aspect, the rates of that particular influencer. So it is reach, resonance, relevance, reputation, region, and then we speak about uh, the rates of that particular influencer. So there's like a small science around. Probably we those. have to add those pointers in our next pitches. <laughs> Do give those, all the R's. We want those R's from you. <laughs> you know, I think, I think one thing on, on this, since you asked about whom to use, like a, exactly. a, a micro- That's a larger micro. question. Yes, yes. So, you know, uh, this is purely from a personal experience of talking to uh, clients and investing in uh, something you're saying. So, client today, and at least uh, many of us are here, client today want, first of all, first, a creator-led content. It does not need to be influencer. It could be a creator, which is a resident, or you get a content creator. So influence comes later. H how can we do creator content itself? Thus, I mean, in our experience, clients like Swiggy and tons of them really today, we have put a full-fledged soundproof studio just to create content for. Uh, so, so the demand from the client today is to first, con uh, you know, from those graphics and stock to all that to have authentic content, which are creator-led content. And I think uh, one very important change that influencers have brought in is to show the brands and agencies the possibilities, right? I mean, today a homemaker can create as good a content as agency can create, right? Yeah. So it's very important that the benchmarks are there. Now, agencies today have to first match to the content quality of a creator. That's one. And then, you know, in order to, so if a brand is a D2C or brand is a long tail brand, we have worked with Mama Art from day one of their, their, uh, their uh, time we have seen that early brands are built on volume, not on one off or two off things. If I am going to pitch to ITC a uh, campaign, I'll bring a big, uh, big name coupled with tons of uh, micro and so on and so forth. But smaller brands, we are tying up with uh, mid-tier influencers, but for longer time, so that the impact on that. But first is a con you know creator like content. Depending on size of the brand, you can look at a long-term perspective or a campaign uh, specific, campaign specific, big name. And uh, you know, I think so. I think important is that whom you are serving, but definitely creator-like content is very, very important today. Just one thing to add: uh, while an agency has to see the content creation space, right? They have to see themselves as a mutual fund for IGC, that is influencer-generated content. The Debate is so. I think earlier we had sessions where we had Harshil speaking that if it is AI versus HI, human intelligence versus artificial intelligence, he made a specific slide to just cut versus to and. So now it's not AI versus HI, it's AI and HI. In a similar fashion, is it a macro influencer or a micro influencer? No, I really think that we'll have to in a very uh, diversified fashion that you'll have to have some, mic some macro influencer to add up to the credibility of the campaign and then based on the XR, like 6 R theory or something like that or maybe based on some sort of relevance or your set of individual agency signs, just bifurcate in hyperlocal categories too. So just choosing one I think could be a very, uh, I would say very loud approach which can also fall back. So that's one way I would want agencies to see. Yeah. So I'll just 
at an angle of, uh, you know, how it pans out. So I'll just uh, quote an example. So back in the day, like two years back, we were doing a campaign for Outfit 7, Talking Tom and Friends, and uh, we were providing app downloads and in-app actions later on. And this we were doing with content which the brand had provided. And, and we first, you know, went back to them and said that, why don't we use an influencer? Why don't we use Shilpa Shetty? And because she has kids also, so it's contextually relevant. And maybe it has a better effect. And we were getting, uh, you know, a cost per download of, uh, you know, 12 rupees. And when we used Shilpa Shetty, we started getting the same download for one and a half rupees. So there is definitely an influence which was created. Uh, it might vary by category as well. And, you know, and, and if you look at the current, uh, the way it, it's panning out for Facebook and Google, they're coming back and saying, why don't we do branded content with influencers? so that the ROI, the click-through rates, the engagement rates, all of those are going, you know, up. Exactly. And, uh, you know, that in a larger scheme of things, uh, you know, it should be tried and tested and not taken on face value. Uh, it might work with certain influencers who are contextually relevant, but having a random list of people who have influence overall, I don't think so that's the way to go about it. Yeah. And to the second question, uh, there, there is a certain uh, where the influencers need to be used. So there, there would be certain film stars, certain cat A influencers, cat B influencers, and cat, you know, uh, below that as well, cat C also. So, you know, one might be for creation of reach, one might be for creation of influence of quality followers, and the third would be like a, as an overall awareness perspective as well. So each of them solves a different purpose, and if it can be tracked back to the final you know, attribution, you know, if, if that's in place while, you know, in India and everywhere else also, while we talk about the journeys and everything, while, but people judge you on the last click attribution for sure. But if that's in place, then I think the entire scheme will work and the clients will also understand overall. I'd just like to add one more thing here. I think, uh, you know, what happens is it's more like uh, branded content versus content that's being uh, put together by another individual. That's really what this is about, not so much about micro, macro, in my opinion, because you know, I think all of them are quite effective. And in that train, I think social proofing could be just as effective, which means I don't even know who's saying what. I mean, who, who is this person? And this person is just a regular consumer, regular mom, or regular whoever who's the consumer, but he or she brings in an additional social proof by saying, listen, I use this product and it works very well for me. And that itself can have a huge amount of value at times, sometimes even more than an influencer because people now know that an influencer is being paid, but a proper organic review can have a far more impact as well. So I think it's, uh, and from a larger brand perspective, it's also about building that balance, you know? So you don't want your feed to look like it is just a lot of people talking about products uh, without any real uh, product, uh, the brand, so to say, ho house being created. So it's, I think it's a little bit of a mix and match that you need to do so that the branded content and, uh, you know, content by people uh, can coexist together. Yep. Perfect. I, I cannot differ on that. And Ranjit, what you just added some time back, I totally agree. It's a bang on theory that brands need creators more than influencers. Uh, I can recollect that because one of the real estate clients that we were handling, uh, we went ahead and did a campaign with vloggers on YouTube who talk about only real estate in that particular market. Their followers were hardly 1,300, 2,000, 5,000. They started reviewing the project and the bookings skyrocketed. The content was mediocre. The equipment used was super mediocre. But the context was most relevant, I believe, instead of going glamzy and glittery and promising like a like A-lister, these were young people in their 20s and they were reviewing the real estate, the product, the flat, the quality, and they, because they were in this space of real estate review and it worked. So yes, now I can relate what you said. And even Manas added a lot of uh, the last attribution model is required for sure, the collective approach. So uh, another point is starting from here because as we collaborate and partner with a lot of 
publishers, uh, influencers. Uh, probably within the agency scope, we have certain agencies like CultureX, who is servicing agencies as well as clients, probably. Uh, so in terms of partnership and collaboration, like larger global group agencies from WPPs, Omnicoms, or LBIs of the world, uh, the independent agencies, what is the edge that we have which can be the right mix? Because we won't partner together, probably. We may partner with Culture X. Let's accept the reality, right? Uh, because if we will partner, the world will call it a merger. <laughs> that these two identities are merging together, their collective revenues and everything, probably. But we may not partner on a project until unless client says that X agency handles my social, Y handles my media, please go ahead and create this campaign together. Otherwise, we may not go together as a collective effort to, for a pitch to win a client. So, as an independent agency, what is that one X factor that keeps us ahead as per you guys? We are all survivors of this apocalyptic world of independent agencies where we were bitten by this bug back 14, uh, sorry, five, seven years ago, probably. So please, somebody, anyone can help us. Um, you know, uh, we actually are uh, sitting together and we work together on the same brand. So he and me work on Nami Poco Pants okay. together, right? Uh, and we're meeting for the first time. Uh, but, uh, and you use the word when we started the whole panel was challenger. We are not just challenger, we are hungry also. And it's survival of the fittest also. Because if I put three matches here, then three agencies will be standing right? Uh, that many agencies have come in the same road. Like in the area where I have my office, I was the only one five years back. Now there are four more agencies in my lane itself, right? Uh, the problem is the entrant to business is zilch. You have three employees, three laptops, you can business. Khada kar sakte. Now that's the problem. Now in this whole space where survival of the fittest is, we are cr cutting the cost madly, right? He's saying that we are spoiling the market by telling them too much measurement metrics. We are also cutting down the cost to drive that business and get that business back. And now if we have to work together, there'll always be an angle being a human that why don't I get that business instead of the other person getting that business. It's very difficult for two people of the same rank. It's like two students in the same class trying to work together that business out. But in group agencies where you know the client will not give the mandate of a particular service to another agency, you do that. Like in Panasonic, I'm working with Adenso, I'm working with Mediacom, where we all have our individual roles clearly defined, and we can't merge. So we know that if we try to do we will not be able to get that part of the business or pie of the business, right? So that's working very well. But the, the reason why a brand comes to an independent agency versus a group agency is, is pure hunger, as well as the attention that they're ready to give to that client. Right? Today, if you look at a Group M, and I'm, uh, no offense to anybody from Group M sitting here, but the kind, <laughs> no offense, <laughs> uh, but the kind of time and attention a Group M employee will give versus a founder-driven agency will give to an, um, a, a client, depending on their budget, is way apart, right? And that's what, first of all, drives them to us. Second is consistently good work. So if you've been their right hand, like we say that one of the key things that we define us as is we are your chote, not chotu. Chote is basically who will go and murder for you also, right? Uh, not the chotu who will bring your food. So if you are the chote of the client, then you are basically their right hand who is saying that, okay, sir, you have told me your problem, whether brand problem or business problem, we'll figure out a solution for you. We'll not say, please send me the brief over an email and then we'll get back to you in a week. Right? So the ownership that we have towards our clientele is way different, which in a country like India, which is not planned, every brief was to be delivered yesterday, not tomorrow. Right? That's where I think uh, independent agencies, to be very honest, have been really successful. And then the third thing comes, the pitch that you were saying. If you had a great pitch, you did a better idea, you genuinely was able to crack that moment at that time of the day, you are home. So these are three big reasons I think independent agencies still get business. I have one point uh, to 
टू हर पॉइंट रियली हमने ना थोड़ा क्लाइंट को बर्बाद भी कर दिया है मतलब यू नो ओके आई वांटेड टू से दैट थैंक यू सो मच वी हैव इट हैज बिकम द रिलेशनशिप वेरी टॉक्सिक नो या या सो आई यू नो आई थिंक व्हाट यू सेड इज राइट दैट यू नो दे कम टू अस बट आई टेल यू ऑन अ पार्टनरशिप आई जस्ट टेक अ मिनट uh you know because uh we are now 11 years old company and we couldn't have been here without partnerships i think uh, uh i met couple of folks here also why optima and couple of folks with whom we have worked long long back so i think I, i tell you partnerships are very important when both the party are not insecure about each other right and if you have those partnerships retain those partnerships so like media partnerships you have production partners is our production uh, partners are working 7 8 years right it's important to have a a you know a, a say a boundary that this is what you are doing this is what you are doing and most partners will not eat into your business because they know that if i have to work long time then the kind of relationship uh, um, uh, what should is men sending ki hum 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 chote hain unke liye and that they cannot go beyond us i mean you know we are solving them the partner is not solving the problem so as long as they are dependent on us for their solution any partner you bring and if partner is sensible and long term part you know i mean long term thinking then partnership works in fact today uh, post 11 years about 10 odd employees of ours have started their own uh, uh, company small agency or uh, i mean production house or xyz we still work with them actually uh, so insecurity ko side mein karke and have boundaries and have long term view you can have long term partnerships also and without partnerships independence cannot grow because you can't have everything in one one uh, you know so uh, yeah. yeah ranjit i am sad that you forgot our collab of course we have just we have just collaborated we have i mean uh, like he said that of course our collaboration is anyway we have just signed up with culture x also i mean and i'm meeting first time Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, yes. I, I have a, I have a metaphor to what you're saying, right? I, I would want the group come. I, I would probably consider the group companies as the elephants, one who are as hungrier than, as hungrier like us, right? I call us like the wolves of the marketing street, and then, like probably, uh, cult. So maybe culture X that way, uh, is not the wolf, but we probably are trying to set the jungle right. so by the way uh, the collab that we guys are speaking about right uh, is also collab that we thought that somebody will have it for us while we were like a marketing agency or like uh, maybe we were trying to create a marketplace of our own and the moment we were not able to get that we raised capital and we were like we are going to be the one who's who will actually partner with a lot of other agencies and give them that environment to actually build something on top of it but yeah i think interesting point yeah thanks i like to add one more thing from a collaboration perspective we were actually just discussing this before we entered on stage right we only talk about collaboration to drive revenue whereas we're not talking about collaboration to make the industry better right somewhere at the end of the day let's say i'll not take a name of client who's not paid me for 6 months now what will he do he'll just go to another agency and say that you know uh, i have my pitch open why don't you come over and pitch me it's a big brand name nobody knows what happens with the finance department but i can pick up a phone on let's say dev and manas i know well, them well beforehand right i can pick up a phone on them and say that this is what happened with me on this agency i i am an ex interactive right so i genuinely pick up a phone on uh, you know rahul who's now moved to essence or abhishek like you know what happened with that client do you think it's worth pitching them what are the challenges when you face working with that client because today getting a business is not difficult there's enough and more business in the market the challenge is to retain them and maintain that relationship it's very difficult so we need to collaborate beyond just getting business we need to collaborate at a level of whether this client is right whether this rules and regulation is right whether this employee is right it's become a one way street with employees today yeah they they can bash you anywhere but you are nowhere to talk about how that employee drove ownership within your organization so there has to be a lot more collaboration today together for example in delhi i have another friend who's running another uh, company i knew the account was not coming to me and because i have another exclusivity with another client so i called him i said you know what here's a client i'm going in your contact why don't you pitch there's another small agency that i have i will not pick a retainer of a particular size so i pick up the phone on him and say you know what i'm not picking up this retainer i know this client very well let me recommend you and you guys get that business so i think collaboration has to go way beyond what we think today it is wonderfully put i have three instances to mention sorry i may just uh, bore you a bit the first is what uh, you said earlier 
about the toxicity of the relationship. Although you did not, Ranjit said, but you kind of uh, uh, endorsed it, right? That at the challenger agency, I am calling it toxic. I think because we kind of service clients above and beyond than a global agency does, right? I'll tell you a small case. In 1819, a client which was working with ARM called me, right? And called me and they said, like, we want you to guys to come and pitch and meet me and uh, we want you guys to take the account. I was aware that they were the clients of ARM. I immediately asked, uh, but you guys were working with ARM, what happened? No, we are not happy with them. I said, then I cannot make you happy. <laughs> Either. <laughs> I honestly said that because all the three people or four people of ARM are all good friends and we know each other for more than 15 years. And we have grown together in this industry and I cannot do anything extra to help them or make or please them or God knows what. And I said it straight over the phone that I'm sorry if they cannot make you feel better or happy, even I can't. That was the first instance. Second, uh, you said about the pitches the best day, the best attempt, the best effort, the best idea wins you the game. Another thing. So we started small, we bootstrapped, we were in a thousand square foot office, moved to 4,000, 12,000 square feet, slowly, gradually, right? The furniture was bad, second hand, to the swanky, nice, everything happens over time. So there was this pitch, we won. It was a new mobile phone entering the market. The CMO was from an existing mobile brand. We won the pitch, everything wonderful. The CMO decides to come to our office. We were a mid-size office back then. He comes to our office for a coffee. He sits with us. He goes back. He says, we can't give you the account. I said, why? He said, no, I, I think uh, Ogilvy is better. I said, no, Ogilvy is best. I can't question that. But we are talking about this pitch. We were better. You only said during the pitch. He said, no, no, I think uh, you cannot handle the load. I just saw your infrastructure. <laughs> right? So just because we were a uh, middle-sized mid -size challenger brand or smaller agency, they clearly said, uh, I think your infra is not adequate enough to handle us. And we could not debate that. Right? The third point which was again uh, beautifully said by Shraddha. Uh, collaboration has to go beyond business. One of my clients did not pay me, later on filed for bankruptcy, and these were media monies, not the retainer monies which I could have written off. I had to pay back to all publishers from my own pocket, slowly, gradually, eventually, yes, I paid off everything. Uh, I think uh, IDAC is this is the uh, first edition of IDAC, and I, 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 I possibly am very happy if you can come up with another idea which can create a collaboration sort of body for us, right? Which can act a kind of a referendum or sort of a charter, which at least hygiene charter, which we all can follow, and another hundreds of young agencies who are coming up, a knowledge sharing platform about clients, about even manpower, which is the biggest problem with us. I think the world will be a better place. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, this is working now. Uh, Google has paid some billion dollars to government right now just because they moved some policy here there. Couldn't they pay for your bills? I mean, somewhere I should figure out a way that somebody who's making so much. I remember five years back, I was uh, billing a uh, for DD360 through Singapore entity of Google, right? And there's something called as Equilabi tax. And I, I don't manage taxes. That's something that my other partner manages. And I'm sorry, this is uh, honesty uh, on this forum. And they asked me to pay it. And I had not charged that to my client. And I was arm twisted that my account will be shut. And fought that for a year, begged in front of them, sir, hum chote hain, challenger brand hai. Kush daya karo, stuff like everything, like everything, dan, bhed, bha, whatever you say, we tried everything, right? But nothing worked. We had to pay that money from the revenue we made from that year. And, and that's the challenge that we are facing. 
Are that comments on don't even talk about <laughs> what we earn. <laughs> you know, we are challenge of Rajna, we don't earn. <laughs> we have all burnt our fingers yeah. in the last seven, eight, ten years of our existence. Uh, luckily, we survived the pandemic. Trust me, most of my peers that I know from the industry who started their shop have shut down. We survived. We were strong enough to survive. So, I think uh, I, IDAC should take I, I more initiatives. Anybody can add any valuable inputs about it. I'm more than happy. Yeah, I, I have a question, I think, uh, to four of you guys. And I think this is very important. I, I really think because this is something that the topic was that uh, the way the times are evolving, how can the independent agencies solve upon what are the existing challenges, right? You guys almost have decades of experience, right? I think uh, uh, we must, so we must I, give it to E4M <laughs> to actually solve this because, you know, I think, I think I mean, they are the ones that who can solve for us with by, by having a forum like that, you know, uh, uh, maybe uh, interact and so on and so forth. Uh, no, thank I think you very much. Uh, Vinay, Vinay has this knack of always asking questions and Vinay, uh, the moderation opportunity will come soon. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to probably touch upon the, no, these no, things. I, that I get it. Every Maybe one of uh, them could probably answer that question. Would you like yeah, to Yeah, so my question just was that you guys, if you guys have to go back maybe tens of years of experience and if you guys have to probably give one piece of advice with whatever you guys have achieved in almost a decade or more than that, right? Because here there are also going to be a lot of emerging agencies which can actually benefit out of your decades of experience, right? One, what is that one piece of advice? And if you could do something differently, maybe touch upon that, please, a little bit. Yeah. See, I, oh I know God, these are like very intense questions, but <laughs> could we have one of you answer? Would yeah, you like I, to? I'll, yeah, uh, you know, try and answer that. I, I, you know, to the younger side of 10 years back, I would have wanted to say no more than saying a yes on some of the things which the client said. And uh, probably should have the wherewithal and the hard work with all the hard work which we've put in, I think have a larger repository of TG and target audience and uh, brands to work with, so that you can, you know, uh, with full confidence say no to people who are unreasonable. And, you know, from a pedigree standpoint, while, you know, E4M has provided a brilliant forum for all of us, agencies are not recognized as much. You know, you might want a client to be here and talk about it, but the nitty gritties of each of the services which are there, we all have gone through the entire process and we know all of that as well. So to the younger self, of course, I would market myself so much so that I have the ability to say no at a certain price or to something which is unreasonable over a period of time. And I think which is why we have survived because we don't sell cheap also. Well put. Interesting, interesting take. <laughs> well, with that, uh, let's humbly thank our panelists with a big round of applause for sharing their knowledge.